The iPhone has long been considered one of the most secure mobile devices on the market, but how did it actually get to this point? Let's rewind 15 or so years and explore Apple's approach to software and hardware security and see how it has evolved over time to combat exploitation. Back in the early days, iPhone hacking was pretty trivial. Some of the first jailbreaks involved simple browser bugs, and they were essentially very basic versions of what we'd know today as a one-click browser exploit chain. They famously went by the name of Jailbreak Me, and you'd simply slide to jailbreak your device on a website in mobile Safari. These jailbreaks were exploiting vulnerabilities in various library parsing codes such as PDF parsers or image and font decoders. They then chained a simple kernel bug to fully compromise the iPhone. This was all very basic textbook style binary exploitation, with effectively zero exploit mitigations. A good bug in a system component was pretty much guaranteed to be exploitable. For the first few years of the iPhone, it seemed that security really wasn't much of a concern from Apple's perspective. Maybe because the growing impact of mobile device usage hadn't really been acknowledged yet. Up until iOS 4, even one of the most fundamental exploit mitigations, known as address space layout randomization, wasn't implemented in iOS at all. For those that don't know, this mitigation introduces a simple randomization to application address spaces. Each time a process is created, a new random ASLR slide value is generated, and the load address of that binary being executed is offset by this amount. The idea here is to make it such that an attacker cannot know the location in memory of certain important structures or code. Before version 4.3, iOS did not have this at all, so processes would be mapped into memory at the exact same static address as their binary file. And even more surprisingly, the kernel did not get ASLR until iOS 6 was released in 2012. It's safe to say now that the iPhone really wasn't a very secure device for its first five years. Around 2014 and onward is when Apple began to show a shift in their security focus, and new protections and mitigations were implemented each year going forward. This was probably fueled partly by the growing jailbreak community, who were consistently publishing new exploits against the latest iOS versions, but also by a genuine security concern for users, as the usage of mobile devices became more and more popular. A notable game changer was with the release of iOS 9 in 2015, where Apple implemented the kernel patch protector for the first time. This was a security mitigation designed to prevent kernel memory tampering, even in cases where an attacker had gained read-write primitives through exploitation. After initial successful exploitation, most exploits would aim to patch or modify certain parts of the kernel code in order to disable security features on the device, such as code signing or sandboxing. The KPP feature was aiming to add an extra layer of security here by having a monitoring system running in exception level 3 that the kernel couldn't touch that would essentially detect any changes made to kernel executable pages and panic the system upon detection. In theory, this was a very strong mitigation against kernel patching. However, this first implementation actually turned out to be flawed and was quickly defeated by the jailbreak community. The following year, with the release of the A10 chip in the iPhone 7, Apple replaced the original KPP implementation with the new KTRL feature, standing for Kernel Text Read-Only Region. This was a much stronger version of the same mitigation, trying to do the same thing as the original KPP, but this time involving a completely new implementation based on some Apple-specific hardware registers in the new CPU. It works like this. During the iPhone boot process, the bootloader will lock down the kernel's read-only region, in other words, any kernel code or immutable data, by initializing these new hardware registers. One of these special registers holds the address of the start of the read-only region, and another holds the address of the end. Every page of memory in between these two is locked once a third register is set, and from this point it can never be unlocked again. Any subsequent attempt to write into one of the protected pages will now cause a fault, and so an exploit that tried to tamper with the kernel's executable pages would trigger a kernel panic, and the device would reboot. This was quite significant in protecting against post-exploitation techniques. The old patches that jailbreakers had traditionally used simply could not be done anymore. However, hackers simply went on to adapt their approach to no longer rely on patching the kernel code, and instead find data-only patch equivalents that would allow them to still elevate their privileges just the same. By the way, if you appreciate the research effort behind making these technical video breakdowns, leave a like on this video and subscribe to help the growth of this channel. With the release of the iPhone XS and the A12 chip, Apple introduced another significant game changer for traditional binary exploitation. Pointer Authentication Codes, or PAC, was first present in this chip, making return-oriented programming no longer a possible exploitation method. In memory corruption exploits before this, attackers would normally want to corrupt a function pointer of some kind 
and then hijack execution flow when that function pointer was used. With pack in effect, however, many pointers, including function return addresses and some other function pointers like object vtable pointers, are now cryptographically signed and a small signature is stored in the upper bits of that pointer value. When trying to branch to one of these pointers, new ARM64E hardware instructions execute authentication logic to ensure that the signature is still valid in this current context. Swapping out a pointer or corrupting a stack return address, like the classic stack buffer overflow technique, were no longer viable as they would trigger a pack exception. Aside from a few pack bypasses, iOS exploits after this mostly moved to data-only attacks, patching values in memory with clever read-write primitives, rather than actually running arbitrary logic through function pointer hijacking. The days of kernel code execution were basically dead at this point. Also implemented in the A12 chip alongside pack was PPL, the page protection layer feature. This is yet another hardware-backed feature, which facilitates an extra privilege mode within the kernel to handle sensitive operations, such as modifying page tables. The kernel can call into this privileged mode in a similar fashion to how a user space process would call into a syscall. Google Project Zero referred to this as a kind of kernel inside the kernel in their PPL technical blog from 2020. The main aim of PPL here is to mitigate page table tampering, even if kernel read and write was already achieved by an attacker. Only code within these PPL routines is capable of modifying these protected memory regions. And so when paired with pack, which prevents an attacker from ever executing a PPL routine themselves, it should be impossible for an exploit to modify these memory regions at all. Apple continued to tighten their sandboxing throughout these next years, restricting access to kernel drivers and other attack surface from popular exploit entry points. Apple has done a great job at isolating kernel attack surface in this way. Rather than allowing an unprivileged app or the browser to talk directly to kernel drivers, they instead create a userland daemon who acts as a middleman. The unprivileged process sends an inter-process communication request to this daemon, and the daemon goes on to make the actual request to the kernel API. This is much safer as it prevents an app from being able to manipulate a kernel API as easily. They have less control on the actual data that gets sent through because it is kind of filtered in a way and repackaged by the middleman process. The more separation in components, the harder it is to attack the entire system, even in the case of a good vulnerability. Requiring extra bugs such as sandbox escapes makes the development cost of a sophisticated exploit chain a lot higher. Another important set of improvements made over the years was to the iOS kernel heap allocator. For many years, exploits had manipulated the kernel heap via heap sprays or shaping strategies to allow them to carefully influence where an object would be allocated. They would use this to cleverly align certain structures in memory, allowing them to exploit buffer overflows or create object type confusion scenarios. From around iOS 13 onwards, Apple started to go all in with heap hardening features. Starting with basic validations, such as the zone require feature, a simple feature that checks if an object is in its expected zone to prevent fake object creation in data only areas. Then they moved on to more sophisticated features like the more extensive randomization of allocations or zone sequestering to prevent virtual pages being reclaimed by another zone, which was a very common technique in use after free exploits. Check out my recent video on a mock port use after free exploit where this exact technique is used. With the release of iOS 16, Apple launched lockdown mode to further protect high profile targets. This was a special configuration that could be enabled on a normal iPhone to completely block access to some of the most popular attack vectors. Apple had basically realized that some attack surfaces were simply always going to contain vulnerabilities. And so for certain people, it was just more beneficial to disable these altogether. For example, disabling just-in-time compilation for JavaScript optimization in the browser completely removes the attack surface of JIT compiler bugs, a very common bug class used in exploits for the Safari browser. Your browser, of course, will run a bit slower without this feature, but for a high-profile target, this performance hit is probably worth it. Another popular attack vector is iMessage zero-click parsing bugs, and with lockdown mode enabled, image previews are now not rendered by default when receiving an iMessage. This does make the user experience a little bit less nice, but again, it blocks a popular point of entry that an attacker might use in an exploit chain. And that pretty much brings us up to the current day, where Apple has just released arguably the strongest protection against memory corruption exploitation yet in the iPhone 17 lineup, memory integrity enforcement. This is Apple's implementation of the ARM feature MTE, which is essentially a hardware-backed address sanitizer capable of catching most types of out-of-bounds accesses and use after free conditions. Check out my other dedicated video on this mitigation for a more detailed analysis. Apple's biggest strength in their mobile device security is their ability to control both the software and the hardware. 
They're able to build hardware-backed proprietary mitigations like PPL or its more recent replacements SPTM and TXM, which deserve their own video breakdowns. Having such a controlled and centralized model reduces the amount of variation between iPhone models and iOS versions. There are no third-party kernel drivers like we see on Android devices, and there are very few inconsistencies between iOS, iPadOS, and even macOS. And all of this combined definitely gives Apple a strong edge over Android in my opinion. So while we do still see some exploits being deployed in the wild against iOS, even going into 2026, as a regular iPhone user, you should generally feel pretty safe. Let me know if I missed any mitigation or security feature that you'd like to see mentioned. I tried to focus on the most important ones from the perspective of exploiting the kernel here. But of course, there are a variety of other mitigation features that help protect user space and the browser. As always, all relevant links will be linked down below in the description. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.